Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining with us today in a celebration for Joe. I'm Haney. I'm Joe's brother. On behalf of Lynn, Jonathan, our families, we want to thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much for your, your thoughts, your prayers, your kind words. They are very much appreciated. This afternoon is a celebration for Joe's life, his loves, his love for his family, his friends, his love for the community, and his love for Chinatown. What we have today is the exhibit of some of his work. Uh, Jonathan has put together uh, some PowerPoint pictures of, of Joe throughout the years. We also have uh, photographs of his uh, annual greeting cards. Many of you commented how beautiful and how much you always waited for that year-end uh, greeting card. So we have them all on there. The music in the background, uh, thank you Jonathan for arranging for that, is Paco Pena. Paco Pena was a very dear friend of, uh, of Joe's, part of the uh, London group when they first met. We have many people to thank this morning, today, this afternoon. Our thanks to the Chinese Culture Center for the very generous support for this celebration. Our thanks to the Dr. Sinnott's and Garden for opening up the garden today. Courtesy, uh, it's in the honor of, of Joe. We hope that uh, after our program, you have a chance to visit the garden. It is absolutely beautiful with the snow in the winter place. Today's program, uh, I will be uh, asking Jonathan to say a few words to, uh, to share with us about, about his father. And then I'll have uh, our other organizations. Now, part of this situation is that when we first planned this, we, we thought we could just have anyone say a few words, because many of us can say a lot of things about Joe. We've had to limit a uh, number of speakers. But by all means, if you wish to write something down, some thoughts, some memories of Joe, uh, Jonathan would, would love to receive them. I would like to call upon um, uh, uh, Jonathan first for, for sharing some, some thoughts with us. Jonathan. Thank you, Uncle Hank. Um, and thank all of you uh, for being here to uh, share the memory of my father. I, I'm overwhelmed with to see all of you here. Um, I thought, I, I'm well aware that my father did many things in the community and contributed to many people uh, in their lives. And I think we have some speakers here who can tell you um, a lot more about that and far better than I ever could. What I'd like to share today is a little bit about um, the man I knew, the man who, it's been surreal reading about my father in newspapers and stuff. Uh, the man I knew was a poem. I think somebody once mentioned or asked my mother if he was, my father was one of those people who was out there in the community doing what he does and never at home. That's absolutely not the case, I'm happy to say. Um, uh, and he was always there for me. I started when I was very, very young. And just being born, I think I had a lot of trouble being born. I don't remember much of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he was there and worrying about it. Uh, deal with hospitals and all that. Uh, he was there when I was a baby or young. Maybe just who woke up early sometimes in whatever change turn to take me on a drive in the Volkswagen convertible uh, Volkswagen van to the Safeway where I could get into the little seats and be driven around the aisles, look at all the shiny birds on the show that I like, really, like, really entertaining for me. Uh, I got older and graduated stuffed animals who played with me for hours with those things and, and I graduated from stuffed animals to G.I. Joe and that kind of thing. Uh, who played with me and 
he loved to read comic books. And he introduced me to comic books. He loved to read to me when I was a child. And he got very disappointed when I learned to read myself. <laughs> <laughs> because I would read the comic books out, um, but he would still be them to keep up with me. Um, and as I grew older, um, went to school and started asking questions about things, he would always be there to answer my questions. I don't think he ever raised a voice to me, ever. And he too rarely ever, ever told me what to do. He would always ask me what I thought, point out the options, he would always say there's another side to the coin. Even if we are already discussed the two sides of the coin, there's always another side. <laughs> Different perspective on that. And I see, you know, from the things that we're doing, what he's done in the community, and how he works in the community when he works with people, I don't think he was that different at home. You know, he wasn't your high charging, last week kind of people are very determined and all that, but you know, the racing voice, everybody else is part of that now. Even as he was able to achieve what he did. And for me, Going up, he always wanted me to do what I wanted to do. He told me very clearly, don't go into architecture. <laughs> <laughs> because he knew that the only way I would do that is if I wanted to do it and willing to do all the things that would be necessary to do it because that was what I love to do. And he loved going to a university in English literature and philosophy, which is a good, you know, good, good guaranteed job. <laughs> <laughs> But he not only gave me the freedom to do that, he encouraged me to do whatever I wanted and forever grateful. Because I feel the value of that many years later. He was always he was always there. I mean, maybe many other children say that at their fathers. He was always there, helping me advice in anything, all of it. Tennis, hockey, um, he loved those things. I, I got them from him. Um, I'm also a long suffering veteran of the hockey team we have here in Vancouver. <laughs> um, and he gave me all those things, he never asked for anything back. And it's a bit of a cliche whenever somebody said that. My dad was the best dad ever, but I'm going to say that. He, he's the best dad I could ever ask for. I'm very thankful for the time we had together. Thank you. Good day, everybody. On behalf of the Chinese Cultural Center of Greater Vancouver, I'd like to address my warmest welcome for everyone to join us today to this, our lifetime event, the celebration of life in honor of Joe Ray. And um, Joe, uh, being Joe Wei being an iconic figure in the Chinese community, and um, all his life he's been uh, designing and building, and you'll find his footprint everywhere in Chinatown and elsewhere in Vancouver. And he built his culture center in 1970, and then he built the 
sang at St. Gallen and then he built the, the museum, and, which is on the other side of this building. And one thing that um, we can tell is the way uh, all his life, his contributions, and uh, which he built Chinatown, and for the last 50 years, uh, Joe Wei been enthusiastic uh, promoting and building Chinatown. And um, um, on top of building architecture, you will find he also built friendship and respect. And then with all you folks sitting here today, uh, is the biggest proof of uh, his success. And Joe Wei passed away which I myself consider as a big loss of Chinatown, a valuable asset of the, uh, uh, Chinatown. And one thing that um, um, he is never, uh, never been, um, he always been upfront and helped people Chinatown. And Personally, I think he got one mission that he, he, he left behind uncompleted. It was like, I, I think he doesn't like to see the new uh, proposed stoning by law, the inclusionary uh, stoning by law, which may change the landscape of Chinatown forever. And, uh, but uh, we will then we'll be continue to uh, fulfill his will. And here I'd like to again um, address my many thanks to everyone here, here, here today. And uh, I'd like to say, Joe and Joe Wei, we always will remember you and miss you. And thank you, everybody. Association was formed in Victoria, 1884. It was the umbrella parent grandparent organization. Uh, our paternal grandfather arrived in Canada at about that time. He was a merchant and businessman. He was also very active in the Chinese Balloon Association in Victoria. I first met the uh, leaders of the Chinese Balloon Association here in Vancouver when Joe took me to my first Chinatown meeting as a fourth year UBC student and he wanted to celebrate the defeat of the Chantum Freeway, round one. <laughs> it remained with us. But we appreciate the leadership role of the Chinese Defense Association. Mr. Tony. Good afternoon, friends. Ladies and gentlemen, we're gathered here to celebrate the life of a Joe, but we also want to take this opportunity to extend our deepest condolence to the family of the late Joe Wei, we now architect and community leader on behalf of the Chinese Development Association of Vancouver. Joe's legacy has touched us all. He was an architect for some of China's most iconic structures. He was also a strong advocate for preserving Chinatown's cultural heritage. For the CDA, Joe was instrumental. With, the sec with security funding assistance from the city, the site grant program, and subsequently restored the CDA building facade to its historic colors. He had played a key role in the CDA Manor project, a CDA housing development with 44 units of family and affordable dwellings located on the historic block 17 at Canton Valley, or that's Canton Valley, the original block of Vancouver's Chinatown. Joe had a passion for Chinatown and the adjacent scrap on the neighborhood for decades. He has tried his work and fought alongside CBA and other activists with the vision to balance historic preservation with the need for development and renovations. 
I have worked with Joe on a number of childhood projects, mostly student. I've been looking forward to working with Joe on the conceptual design for, of a Kamenlun monument in Chinatown as part of the BC, British Columbia legacy initiatives. He's a timely passing. Definitely leaves a void in my treasured memory with Joe. Joe, you'll be sorely missed. We are definitely, we are deeply saddened to lose a huge guy in the community. But Joe's legacy with us will live on. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Matthew Hafferson, who is the past chair of the Dr. Simpson Garden. The garden uh, today is a courtesy, welcoming, open day. So please have a chance to visit. I should mention that the garden is 31 years old this year. Before it opened in April of 1986, Joe arranged for us families to visit the garden. And uh, Jonathan, you were just quite young then, and our son and daughter were even younger. Now, so much for the beauty of the Dr. Sun Yat-sen classical main-style garden. The garden is a great place for kids to run around. So our, our, our son and daughter grew up referring to the Dr. Sun Yat-sen garden as Uncle Joe's garden. <laughs> so please have a chance later on to visit Uncle Joe's garden. Matthew. Thank you, Hank. I'm, I'm honored to be able to pay a tribute to Joe on behalf of the Dr. Simons and Garden Society. Uh, I got to know Joe when I was the president of the society and learned more about his extraordinary personality when I was the chair of the Chinatown Historic Area Planning Committee. And uh, the words from Jonathan triggered something in my memory. Uh, when, when I was serving in that capacity, where I would get emails from Joe, and they wouldn't be telling me what to do but they would be asking questions <laughs> that would make me think about what I should be doing. <laughs> so I, I was very fortunate to benefit from Joe's wisdom and knowledge. Uh, and, and I also, in the way I imagine he would be happy to remember, I uh, think of him in his role as an agitator working to defend community values. Joe was an irreplaceable loss to the garden because he was there for the design, the construction, and the subsequent expansion. So at a practical level, he was always happy to answer questions about when and how elements within the garden were installed or repaired. But you wouldn't often get such a simple answer from him. It was always clear in his mind why the garden came together the way in which it did. And for Joe, the what was often simply a way to open conversations about the why. Last year, the garden published the second edition of In a Chinese Garden. Uh, the book explains the garden and includes a number of articles that introduce the elements, ideas, and its history. Joe Wei's article in that book describes the development of the garden project from conception through to completion. And I'm sure this will be of no surprise to those who knew him uh, that in his article, Joe takes virtually no credit for his contributions as design consultant. Instead, he lays out the cultural and political context of the garden and identifies by name many of the funders, politicians, community members, consultants, and craftsmen who collaborated to create the garden as we know it today, many of whom are actually in this room today. Uh, through, through this project and the many that came after, Joe's ego remained profoundly under control. <laughs> he was an anti architect who valued building capacity within the community over forcefully imposing his own vision on others. And this is not to say that he was without influence or vision. Joe understood that strong communities require actively engaged citizens. 
To this end, he used his professional stature and disposition within the community to plant seeds, to build up those around him, and provide a space where different ideas and viewpoints could be shared and debated. Joe also understood that to strengthen the community's values, you need to reach out both within and outside its boundaries. Joe reached out frequently. For Joe, the garden marked a maturing of the Chinese cultural presence in Vancouver. Through the garden, he introduced much of Vancouver for the first time to Chinese high culture. He compared and contrasted the traditional Chinese garden typology against equivalent formal Western gardens like Versailles. He aspired to build understanding and appreciation for other cultural lenses through which to see our place in the world by building the garden in Vancouver. Joe was completely conscious of the impact of politics and social will on culture and city making. Following the debates and protests of the 60s and 70s surrounding the construction of freeways and the clearing of historic neighborhoods in the area, he understood that a Chinese cultural center and garden on this site, the very beginning site of Vancouver's Chinatown, was an important tactic in defeating forever the idea of a freeway through the district. Joe was a Canadian-style activist of his generation through and through. Joe's Canadian political activism and respect for his Chinese culture came together in the one-of-a-kind creation of the garden that was only possible under the leadership of a one-of-a-kind one person. We are fortunate to be left with the physical artifacts of Joe's work that serve as reminders of the constant need to develop bridges of cultural understanding to protect the values that give neighborhoods identity and to support and build capacity within the voiceless in our communities. I hope many of you took the opportunity to today to drop by the garden, and if you haven't, that you will do so after, uh, uh, to experience a moment this great gift from Joe. In memory of Joe, we've shot the film, as he said, and we've opened the gates. Think for a moment now about Joe's great passion into his last years, even his last days, uh, to convey to everyone the idea of Chinatown character. And think how different the conversation about this central place in Canadian history would be if he had not been here for the garden and the many other structures that anchor this place today. Thank you, Joe. Institute of British Columbia, Carl uh, Gustafson. Uh, Joe last year was the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the AIBC. Thank you. Museum, Archives, Heritage Alley, and Dynasty Bell, 
Chinatown Plaza Arcade, the Chinatown Millennium Gate, the Chinese Freemason Building Restoration. This received the ABC Special Journey Heritage BC Thank you for Heritage Award. The IBC 2016 Lifetime Achievement Award went to Joe. We regaled those gathered, it was a great evening. We regaled those gathered with highlights from your career spent protecting cultural heritage and communities for architectural intervention. The highlight, and this was a highlight of the evening, was Joe's friend and SFU professor emeritus, Ian Walls, who performed a Guao Ban Shu, or Bamboo, Bamboo Clapperdale, piece entitled Big Bad Joe. <laughs> and if you weren't there, that was really a very memorable moment. Joe taught at the BBC School of Architecture from 76 to 1980. He was an AIBC Council from 85 to 87. Received the Barbara Dalrymple Memorial Award in 2001. Over the past 40 years, Joe has served on civil design panels, volunteered with community organizations. In recognition of this community of service, Joe received the Bank Ever Civic Mayor Award in 2013. Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2013, a Doctor of Letters, Emily Currents of Design and Art 2001, and the Canada 125 Medal in 1993. Joe's tenacity mixed with disarming humbleness set him apart, said AIBC President Carl Condon. Vancouver's lost a great architect and a tireless champion of community spirit and resilience. It is our good fortune that his legacy lives on through his architectural designs that helped define the city of Vancouver, along with the many architects he inspired. Thank you, Joe. The submission team that nominated Joe for the AIBC award, uh, members of the team, we, we call ourselves the A team. We worked hard, but it was a work of love work of deep respect. Members of the AT got back together and helped put on this program for them too. So AT members, thank you. The major challenge for the AT in making the submission was trying to keep it a secret from Joe. And so AIBC had made the decision. And that was not an easy task. When he uh, received the award, he was absolutely overwhelmed. He had no idea it was coming. That weekend, um, he phoned members of the A-Team, including myself, to say, thank you, appreciate it. I said, it was a work of love, it was a work of respect. But he said, boy, he, I understand you had a lot to do writing the biography. I said, uh, yes, I did. And the biography is listed in the back there. We talked about his early life and university and his career. And then he said, well, hey, they're just a couple of minor things <laughs> in that biography that you not quite right, or it's not right. I said, oh, what was that? And he said, well, you mentioned that I, when I went to King Edward High School, I was a top ping pong player, table tennis player. He said, that, that's true, Dan. But I was also a Western Canadian junior champ. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> the biography also references that I was the top table tennis player when I went to the School of Architecture. That's true. But I was the top player at UBC. <laughs> I said, you know, if I Called you for that information, you may suspect that something was going on. And true Joe fashion, he said, It's okay, he. It's okay. Thank you.